One of the more interesting features of CK3's DLC Roads to Power is the option for one of 100, technically 101 characters to spawn in your game, creating more dynamic worlds with real influential people from history wandering around for you to recruit or even play as. Today, I will attempt to explain who all of these characters are in a video that is hopefully not several hours long, but looking at this script, I know it's not going to be short. While yes, you could have found all this information with a quick Google search, this video ensures you don't have to, and you didn't, so that's why you're watching it. Also keep in mind that these characters in game are not confined to their traditional nations or cultures and can crop up at random, but I believe they are confined to their own time periods, so you know where to kind of look for them. So sit back, relax, and put your listening ears on as we explore this vast and great addition to the game. Aaron of Lincoln was an English Jewish financier, believed to be the wealthiest man in Norman England during the 12th century. With his wealth, he often built abbeys and monasteries to include St. Albans Abbey and Lincoln Cathedral, and hired a series of agents working within facilities that operated basically as a bank for the wealthy and elite nobility alike. Abhinavagupta was an influential Kashmir poet, theologian, and polymath, and is considered a master of Indian philosophy, having completed 35 different works and studied under no less than 15 mentors of various faiths and creeds in his pursuit of knowledge. Abraham Ibn Ezra was a renowned Jewish poet, a religious commentator, and hailed from Cordoba in Spain. He is famous for his almost rationalistic views for explaining the stories and lessons of the Torah, his scientific papers, and for his travels which spanned from 1137 to his death in 1164. He wrote poems on the places he saw and managed to reach as far as Baghdad. Akka Mahadevi is an important figure in female emancipation in India thanks to her revolutionary principles. Akka was a devout follower of Shiva and wrote extensively on her devotion as a means of achieving enlightenment, saying she was a woman only in name, but her body, mind, and soul belonged to her faith. She supposedly rejected wearing clothing and grew her hair long, wearing it as a sort of garment in defiance to any earthly luxury, although more likely she simply rejected expensive garments, but it's hard to say because a lot of depictions of her have her wearing this sort of hair-like clothing garment thing. Al Biruni is called many things, father of comparative religion, which is essentially a study of the world's religions by comparing their principles and philosophies, the father of modern geodesy, or basically the mapping of celestial bodies in their appropriate place in the heavens, and is often also called the first archaeologist. He was, in his own time, an acclaimed physicist, mathematician, astronomer, linguist, and natural scientist who was lauded with royal sponsorships from people of many nations and beliefs. A true scholar, if ever there was one. Alfonso de Borgia, known to history as Pope Calixtus III, studied and was a professor of law at the Spanish University of Leleda, which he translated into a career as a diplomat for the kings of Aragon. A career which earned him his eventual bishop and cardinal appointments after arranging a reconciliation between King Alphonse V of Aragon and Pope Martin V for Alfonso V's initial support of the Aragonese anti-pope Benedict XIII during the Western Schism. As Pope, he most famously issued the retrial of Joan of Arc, absolving her of her heretical status and for his conception of the Angelus Noon Bell, which signaled to Catholics then to pray for the soldiers fighting in the siege of Belgrade, and today reminds Catholics to pray at noontime. Arethas of Caesarea was a scholar and archbishop of Caesarea in modern-day Turkey. He is credited with preserving numerous ancient texts from Plato to Marcus Aurelius's meditations, and wrote commentaries on their worth and merit in letters and official codices. Arnaldus de Villanova, known today as a physician and religious reformer, served as a doctor and ambassador for various courts in France, Italy, and Catalonia, including for King Peter III of Aragon and Pope Benedict XI. He is perhaps most famous for his translation of preeminent Arabic texts to understand and disseminate their teachings. In his later life, he was briefly in prison and hunted by the Inquisition for his beliefs under the influence of Joachim Fior that the world would end in 1378 with the coming of the Antichrist. He is often thought of as the reason for the Papal Bull of 8 September 1309, which required all medical students to learn and retain teachings of some 15 Greco-Arabic treatises, which he had translated. Atisha might be the most straightforward one of these to explain so far. He was a Buddhist master from Bengal who helped spread the faith throughout Asia and is often regarded as one of the preeminent figures of medieval Buddhism. Averano de Medici is also, thankfully, not too hard to describe. He is the founder of the Medici Bank and the first historically significant member of what would become the Italian banking and political dynasty that was the House of Medici, which produced four popes, two queens of France, and would come to essentially rule Florence for the better part of 300 years. Averroes, the Andalusian polymath, jurist, and scholar, wrote more than 100 books on subjects from philosophy to astronomy and linguistics. He is often regarded as the commentator or the father of rationalism for his writings and expansions on the teachings of Aristotle, some of which were considered controversial in the West, with prominent thinkers like Thomas Aquinas and the Catholic Church itself condemning his assertions, such as his theory that all human beings share the same intellect 
or a unity of intellect. Avicenna is our last A on this list and is yet another preeminent scholar from the Muslim world who served in the court of various Iranian rulers and is often considered the father of early modern medicine. With his works like The Book of Healing, a philosophical and scientific encyclopedia, and The Canon of Medicine, an encyclopedia of medical practices and studies used at medical universities for centuries. He is said to have written somewhere around 450 books ranging from alchemy to poetry to theology and beyond. Basava was a prominent follower of Shiva and member of the Bhakti movement, which sought to bring religious reforms to all strata of Hindu society. Basava condemned human and animal sacrifices, gender roles, social discrimination, and superstitions within the faith. He wrote extensively on these topics and served as chief minister of the Western Chalukya Empire, where he introduced a new public institution which allowed men and women of all backgrounds to discuss spiritual and everyday topics. Basil Lycopenos was the illegitimate son of Byzantine Emperor Romanus I. Basil was a eunuch and served as something called the Parakoimomenos, which was essentially the regent or hand of the king under Emperor Constantine VII, his brother-in-law, as well as Emperors Romanos III, his nephew, Nikephoros II Phocas, John I Symmachus, and Basil II the Bulgar Slayer, his great nephew, essentially serving the position for around 40 years. He also led troops against the Arabs in 958, and for his great victory alongside future Emperor John I Symmachus, was awarded a triumph, and as if he didn't do enough, he was, according to scholars, a massive patron of Byzantine art, with many of his commissions surviving to this day. Basilios Bassarin was a Byzantine Greek humanist, Catholic cardinal, and scholar. He served as the Latin patriarch of Constantinople and was considered for the papacy twice. He, like many scholars on this list, was a translator and preserver of ancient texts like Aristotle's Metaphysics and Xenophon's Memorabilia, as well as the Bibliotheca, a compendium of Greek mythology. Benjamin of Tudela was a medieval Jewish explorer who traveled throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa in the 12th centuries, and whose descriptive texts on Western Asia preceded the adventures of Marco Polo by about 100 years. His writings today are lauded for their depictions of everyday medieval life and for exploring the diverse Jewish communities throughout the world that he came across. Vaskara Charya, Indian polymath, engineer, astronomer, and mathematician, was also known as the leader of the Cosmic Observatory at Ujjain, which was in his time the mathematical center of ancient India. His significant contributions to mathematics and astronomy have earned him the common moniker of greatest mathematician of medieval India. St. Bridget of Sweden, one of the six patron saints of Europe, Bridget was a mystic and healer who founded the Order of the Most Holy Savior, better known as the Bridgetines, a monastic order of nuns. She was an advocate for church reforms towards humility, penance, and charity, and was said to experience visions of Christ's suffering on the cross. She supposedly conversed with Jesus in these visions and wrote down her revelations, which were published posthumously. Today, she is known as a fierce believer and advocate for the church and mothered a saint herself, actually, St. Catherine of Sweden. Chrétien de Troyes, another easy one here. Troyes was a French medieval writer who wrote chivalric romance novels about Arthurian legends like Gawain, Lancelot, Percival, and the Holy Grail. His use of structure in these writings is often viewed as a step towards the modern novel. Number 20, look at this. We're already at number 20. Aren't you excited? Christine de Pizan was a French court chronicler for King Charles as well as several dukes, and her writings are considered to be some of the earliest forms of feminist literature. Her most famous works are The Book of the City of the Ladies and The Treasures of the City of the Ladies, which aim to both educate and defend defend medieval women in the eyes of society. Constantine the Pathfulgonian was the son of a peasant and worked as a money changer before finding a job in the Byzantine court with the help of his brother John, who was a eunuch. Handsome and energetic, he caught the eye of then Empress Zoe, who would eventually rule as co-empress with her sister Theodora in 1042. The two began a flirtatious and then amorous relationship and supposedly plotted to kill her husband, Emperor Romanus II, who died mysteriously on 11 April 1034 by poison or by drowning. Either way, he was found in a bathtub. The two then, because they couldn't be subtle, married the exact same day, and Constantine was crowned the next day, becoming Michael IV. Always of poor health and suffering from various epileptic fits, Constantine delegated most of his official duties as emperor to his brother John, but his most famous accomplishment as emperor was, was quashing a Bulgarian rebellion before dying at the age of 30, which some say was also under mysterious circumstances, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Dante Alighieri is probably one of the most recognizable names on this list. He was an Italian poet, writer, and philosopher whose masterpiece of divine comedy is considered one of the greatest works of literature, not only in its native Italian, but the world over. His effect on the entire Western canon of writing cannot be understated as it adapted the greats of Homer and Virgil, a chief character in his own work, and inspired writers like John Milton who wrote Paradise Lost. 
The fact that we still, 700 years after the fact, study his writing so attunely, and that most of you undoubtedly know who he is, is an attestment to how cool this inclusion is in the game. Demetrios Kyodonis was a Byzantine theologian and statesman who served three terms as the Mezzanon, basically the imperial prime minister, under emperors John the Sixth Cantacuzinus, John the Fifth Palaiologos, and Manuel the Second Palaiologos. His most famous efforts were those to bridge the gap of the East and Western Christian churches within Byzantium as the, as the encroaching Muslims slowly became the dominant force in the region and Byzantium tore itself apart. Ego Skolgrimson was a skald, berserker, and farmer, and is a semi-historical figure and anti-hero from a story known as Egil's Saga, where he not only kills his first man or boy at the age of seven for cheating him in a game, but also becomes rivals with King Eric Bloodaxe, killing his son in a duel and placing a curse against the king on a pole inscribed with magic runes. Though eventually he was captured by Eric, he convinced him to free him by writing essentially an incredibly long song about how great Eric was in one night. He also, because he has a grudge against Norway, fought for the kings of England against Norway during the Viking Age. Kind of a crazy little guy. Eric the Red was a Norwegian explorer who founded the first settlements in Greenland and fathered the well-known explorer Leif Erikson, who some consider to be the first European to set foot in North America sometime in the 10th century. Eustathius of Thessalonica was a Greek scholar and archbishop of Thessalonica and is better known as a saint of the Greek Orthodox Church for his chronicling and bravery in the face of the invading Normans during the sack of Thessalonica in 1184 an event that ultimately contributed to the Fourth Crusade. His commentaries on Homer are likewise studied to this day by scholars. Gemistos Pletho is one of the most famous scholars of the late Byzantine era because of his rejection of Christianity in favor of Hellenism with an ancient wisdom he based on the teachings of Zoroaster. Uh, for his efforts, which include convincing one of the Medicis to found a new Platonic academy in Florence, he is often seen as the last Helleni. Chaucer was a poet and civil service person, but none of that matters. You best remember him as the writer of the Canterbury Tales, one of the masterpieces of the late medieval period. The same thing's kind of true for the next writer, who was a Arthurian writer. This is Geoffrey of Monmouth, who hailed from Monmouth, Wales, and is best known for his work on the history of the kings of Britain, which was wildly popular and often translated throughout Europe, but is today considered largely ahistorical. But he's also famous for his work on popularizing and creating a sensible history of the real King Arthur and inventing characters like Merlin. Georgius Pachymeris, one of the more obscure figures on this list so far as I could tell, was a Byzantine Greek historian, philosopher, and musical theorist, best known for writing 13 books of Byzantine history detailing the reigns of Michael and Andronicus II, Palaiologos a book known simply as The History. Giotti de Bondon, I think this actually may be our first painter on the list, was an acclaimed Italian Gothic and Proto-Renaissance painter who was described as one of the greats within his own life. So let's just show off his masterwork. Look at it, it's pretty nice. Expect anything else about painters on this list to be this short. I don't know anything about painting. I like looking at it, that's it, it's cool. All right, let's move on. Giovanni Boccaccio is considered one of the three crowns of Italian literature alongside Dante Alighieri and Petrarch, who is also on this list. Giovanni was a writer whose work some considered to be the pinnacle of European prose at the time and which influenced famous writers such as Chaucer and Cervantes who wrote Don Quixote. Some of his writing and ideas are seen as a precursor to humanism and during his life was a huge advocate for Dante's work, particularly the Divine Comedy and his public image. Grigor Tatsavatsi is, was a bit of a hard character on this list because I couldn't find out much about him, but he was apparently an Armenian philosopher and theologian who during his life advocated against the Armenian Apostolic Church unifying with Rome. And besides writing extensively like many during this period, he was supposedly able to heal people by laying hands on them, which is cool. Gunlaug Omstuga or Gumlauger was a, I believe, semi-historical skald who bore the moniker Serpent Tongue for his lewd poems. After a quarrel with his father, he left home at the age of 12 and stayed with Egil Skalgrimsons, remember him, his son Thorstein, where he fell in love with Thorstein's daughter, Helga. At 18, the two agreed to an engagement on the condition from her father that Gunlag, who was about to leave for the royal courts of Norway, Ireland, Orkney, Sweden, and England, would not be gone for more than three years. Unfortunately, Gunlag's stay in England with King Athelred pushed his time away to four years, and when he returned in 1005, his Helgi was married to his rival, Hrafn a skald he had met and had bitter previous relations with in Sweden. Gunlog then challenged Hrafn to a duel, the last in Iceland, but because killing in duels was forbidden, it ended in a draw. Thus the two went to Norway where they dueled once more in 1008, and Gunlog slew Hrafn, but was mortally wounded and died at the age of 25. Helgi was said to mourn for the rest of her days, dying in the embrace of a fur cloak Gunlog had given her as a girl. Kind of kind of sad, but there you go. Hasde Krekas, a Spanish Jewish philosopher, was known as a rationalist and served as crown rabbi in Aragon, but suffered greatly because of his faith and heritage as a Jew, even losing his only son to the massacre of 1391, where Jews in Barcelona were rounded up and killed 
Still, he kept his faith and wrote many important works for Jewish rationalism, including the Or Adonai, a refutation of medieval Christian Aristotelianism and a champion of medieval sciences. Another Hasdei, Hasdei ibn Shaprut, was a Spanish Jewish physician and statesman who helped usher in the golden age of Hebrew letters in Moorish Spain. Serving as a patron for Jewish writers in everything from science to poetry and literature, he served as a vizier for an Umayyad caliph, in all but name and with extensive knowledge of Hebrew, Arabic, and Latin, facilitated treaties between the Arabic and Christian world, and translated numerous Latin and Hebrew texts to Arabic. Eloise and Peter are only dual entry on this list. Eloise was an abbess and Peter a theologian. The two were deeply and madly in love, a love doomed to fail. This was the crux of their fame, their letters to one another, which they wrote during their fiery passion and after as peers, which were published posthumously in the 12th century in France, and today serve as primary sources on medieval gender roles, love, and monastic living. Hemachandra was a saint of the Jain faith and was a genius. That's probably the easiest way to look at him. A philosopher, a yogi, a law theorist, a lexicographer, a logician, and much, much more. He is the father of the modern Gujarati language, and while serving as an advisor to a king, he wrote an epic poem in Sanskrit called Deeds of the 63 Illustrious Men, which is a historical count of important Jainism figures. Saint Hildegard von Bingen, or Sybil of the Rhine as she's sometimes known, was a Benedictine abbess and polymath who wrote everything from music to hymns to medicinal and botanical texts. She was supposed to have visions which she claimed came from God, and her writings often reflected not only these visions, but an extensive knowledge and understanding of modern and ancient scripture. She detailed these visions extensively in her works, many of which are considered theological masterpieces of the medieval period. She exchanged letters with the Pope, kings, and the simple commoner, and received and reciprocated their inquiries with brilliance and valuable insight. Though she has been listed as a saint for centuries, she was actually only formally canonized in 2012 by Pope Benedict XVI and was proclaimed Doctor of the Church for her contributions not only to the health of the individual person, but the spirituality of the faith. This is Hrat Shvida. I don't know if I said that right. Though you've probably not heard of Hrat Shvida. She was a secular canonist who wrote drama and poetry. She is considered the first female German writer, the first female historian, and the first person since the fall of the Western Roman Empire to write dramas in Western Latin. And the first German female poet. So a lot of firsts. Some of her dramas recorded her life, making her one of the only people of that period to record the life of a woman from the perspective of a woman. So she's also an important feminist writer as well. al Hazen was a medieval Islamic polymath and scientist and is considered the father of modern optics, though he contributed largely to mathematics, astronomy, and physics as well. He was the first person to correctly explain the theory of human vision and how it was conducted in the brain, and is often contributed with having developed an early form of the scientific method before its popularity with Renaissance scientists. Thus, he is occasionally described as the world's first true scientist. His work in the various sciences was used and cited extensively by future scientists like Isaac Newton, Johannes Kepler, and Galileo Galilei. So, kind of a big deal. Ibn Kaluta, this one's going to be short and to the point, he's considered one of the greatest social scientists of the Middle Ages and is called the father of historiography, sociology, economics, and demography studies. Jalaluddin Rumi, known commonly as Rumi, was a medieval poet who wrote mostly in his native Persian, though he occasionally wrote in other languages as well. His works have remained popular for centuries, and he is still one of the best-selling poets in the world. For a time, he was actually the best-selling poet in the U.S., fun fact. This next guy, Jengar, is not real, but this dude is crazy. He's the protagonist of the epic Mongolian poem, often just called Jengar, which focuses on the Kalmyks, which were a nomadic peoples of Mongolia who actually settled in Europe. The story begins with Jengar's great-grandfather, but eventually settles down to Jengar himself, who, as a child, avenges his father's death at the age of two, by destroying three castles with his bare hands before slaying a rival warlord, a rival horse lord rather, with a sword at the age of three, and then assembles his war band after that. It's a pretty crazy story that I was reading into. I was going to write it down, but it just sounded so crazy. Just know that this guy is built different. If you want to play as a character who's absolutely insane, if he shows up, just pick him. Meister Eckhart, I'm not going to explain this well, I'm really bad at everything, but he was a Dominican Catholic priest, theologian, and mystic, and is best remembered for his controversial views on God and the soul, believing them to be separate in many respects. That's a huge oversimplification, but I'm not a theologian, and despite how much I tried to read it in summary, that's the best I could come up with. In his life, he was tried for heresy, but died before a verdict could be rendered, though he was absolved of any wrongdoings. A few years ago, again, 
by Pope Benedict XVI. That guy's doing a lot of stuff. Today, he remains an important medieval scholar and theologian, though I am told to understand his ideas, you'd have to have some knowledge of his historical time period and the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas, who is also on this list, but I also know very little about. John Exuch, which I don't know if I'm saying that last name right, so we're just going to say John, was a Megas Domesticos, or commander-in-chief of the Byzantine army during the reign of John II and Manuel I Caminos. John was a Turk and orphaned at a young age after being captured in Nicaea. He was given as a present to Emperor Alexios I Komnenos and raised alongside his son, John. <laughs> Which is going to make this confusing, but I'm just going to call John Emperor John and R. John John. John was basically Emperor John's only close friend and confidant. And once Emperor, all Emperor John's family were required to go to other John to speak with Emperor John. I'm sorry, I know. It's just, this is confusing. Through this... John, our John, General John, was able to foil a plan by Anna Comnini to usurp her brother, Emperor John, but also advocated for her fair treatment and the reconciliation of the siblings. John, General John, marched on numerous campaigns in the Balkans and Anatolia besides Emperor John and was the primary reason Emperor John's son, Manuel I Comnenos, became emperor. Because of Emperor John's personal involvement in his military campaigns, our General John is one of the more well-documented generals in comparison to other Byzantine generals because usually nobody really cared, but because he was right there with him, history remembers him well. I'm sorry that there's so many Johns, but there you go, that's who he was. And wouldn't you know it, wouldn't you know it, the next one's a John. John the Orphanotrophos, we've actually talked about his brother already, but this is the guy who Paradox stated in their preview for this DLC was likely the real life inspiration for A Song of Ice and Fire's Varus. And you know what, they're probably not far off. He was potentially the son of counterfeiters and was the brother of future Emperor Michael IV, who we talked about earlier. He was a schemer. He used his brother's romance with the Emperor's wife to position his brother to become Emperor and probably even assisted in Emperor Romanus III's death, basically being his brother's right-hand man. He essentially gave other members of his family high positions of importance in the court. John was also the one who convinced Zoe to adopt his sister's son, Michael, as her own, securing the continuation of his family on the throne. When the sickly Michael IV died, some say under suspicious circumstances, potentially because of John. His adopted son, Michael, became Emperor Michael V. John then made his nephew Constantine his protege with the apparent idea of making him the next in line for the throne. But Michael V was not having this and had John exiled to a monastery and all male members of his line castrated to prevent further machinations of the shadowy eunuch, who died on the Isle of Lesbos in 1043. So Paradox probably isn't wrong with the assessment that Varys is based on John because this guy was doing all kinds of stuff. I'm, I'm not doing this on purpose, but there's like two more Johns before we, <laughs> when we get to 50. 49 is also John. John Setsis was a Byzantine poet who worked tirelessly to preserve ancient Greek literature, much of which he compiled in his book of histories, which is essentially a long poem containing literary, poetic, historical, and mythological tales, which quotes some 400 authors. He used this basically as a way to cite his citations in many of his letters that he wrote to other people throughout his life, which is a weird thing to do, but you know, whatever. All right. <laughs> Let me take a breath, smell the air. We're at number 50. And this is actually a really important figure for the Protestant, or I guess early Protestant movement. This is John Wycliffe, who was an English philosopher, Christian reformer, priest, and theology professor at Oxford. He believed that the mortal sin of man meant the church was not entitled to rule over anyone, and that those of the clergy should live in poverty and not the wealth and luxury that the Catholic Church had come to know and take advantage of in the medieval period. His work and writings would go on to greatly influence other important pre-Protestantism reformers like the Czech Jan Hus, who many of you undoubtedly also know. All right, it's all downhill from here. We're at 51, Joseph Raban. Now there's almost nothing about this guy, but Joseph was an Indian Jewish merchant who organized the South Indian Merchant Company on Juman, which banded together Jewish, Christian, and Islamic merchants from West African countries. Joseph Tartaniotis is another kind of obscure one. He was a Byzantine general, but he's best remembered for deserting the Emperor Diogenes at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071. And this saw Byzantine power greatly undermined in Anatolia, which would eventually result in the region completely falling under Seljuk control. I don't know why this guy is on here. Actually, I don't know why you would want to play as him at all, but maybe to correct history? I don't know. Karunakara was a general in the Chola Empire in India, and I admit my knowledge of Indian history is incredibly limited, but it seems he was an important part of the Chola invasion of the Kalinga region, which he helped conquer for his emperor. Kishamendra was a Sanskrit polymath, poet, philosopher, dramatist, translator, and art critic. He was widely sought after for his skill in abridging longer texts, much like me, and for the wide variety of his writings, many of which still survive. Lahire was a prominent French commander during the 100 Years' War, and was a close friend of Joan of Arc, actually, and fought 
went alongside her at Orléans. He was often known to pray before battle, which many attributed to Joan's influence. La Hire is credited with a large portion of the French victory at the Battle of Gevroy and Pate, though this latter is often contributed to Joan of Arc, actually, who was not there. His nickname, La Hire, is often translated as the Wrath or the Wrath of God. So pretty cool knight figure. Leonardo Fibonacci is often seen as the most talented Western mathematician of the Middle Ages. Many of you probably know him for this symbol known as the Fibonacci sequence or spiral. But Fibonacci also popular popularized the Indo-Arabic numeral system in Europe, which I think is much more impressive after the publication of his Book of Calculations. Gersonides was a French medieval Jewish scholar and is often credited with various mathematical breakthroughs and for his rationalism of the Bible's miracles meaning he was a follower of Aristotelianism. This meant many accused him of heresy. Likewise, he is noted for his astronomical advances, such as the invention of an instrument called Jacob's Staff, a device that measures the angular distance between celestial objects. He seemed to be a master of a great many subjects and was, for all intents and purposes, a genius like many of the other remarkable individuals on this list. Matafachara, I know I said that wrong, I'm sorry, was the founder of the, of the Devada school of Vendada in the Hindu faith and is also known as Purna Prajna. He was a philosopher and theologian who wandered India spreading his beliefs. Beliefs. Maimonides was a prolific Torah scholar, Sephardic rabbi, and personal physician of Saladin himself. He is easily one of the most acclaimed Jewish figures of the Middle Ages and was a polymath interested in numerous religious and scientific subjects, and his 14-volume Mishnah Torah still bears significant canon authority to the Jewish faith to this day. He is considered by many to be among the greatest scholars of Judaism, at least in his own time. Manuel Cholobolos was a Byzantine monk who opposed the union of the churches during the reign of Emperor Manuel VIII Palaiologos, who had recently retaken Constantinople from the Latin Empire. Basically, Manuel was against the reunification of the Eastern Orthodox and Catholic Church and was actually exiled for it by Emperor Michael VIII, but returned when Michael's son Andronicus II took the throne and rejected the union. Manuel Mashapolos, and I apologize for the brevity on this one, was a professor who is best remembered for his work as a grammarian and for correcting errors and translated ancient texts which future scholars would use to study them. That's that's literally it. This next one, Marco Polo, is not simply a swimming pool game, but is one of the most recognizable explorers of the medieval period. He was a merchant from Venice, traveled along the Silk Road throughout Asia from 1271 to 1295, during which he wrote his book, The Travels of Marco Polo. Whilst on his travel, he was spotted by the emperor Emperor Kublai Khan for his sharp wit and mind and for 17 years served him as an emissary. Though not the first European to travel and live for a time in that part of the world, his records were among the first of their kind and detailed the first Western recordings of Eastern innovations like gunpowder, paper money, and the various animals of the region. His findings and travels greatly impacted and altered the way the West saw and documented the world. Saint Michael Choniotis was a Byzantine Greek writer and cleric who served as the abbot of Athens and in 1204 defended the Acropolis from the forces of Leo Sogurus before ultimately surrendering it and the city to members of the Fourth Crusade in 1205. Today, he is remembered by scholars for possession of two poems by ancient Greek poet Callimachus and for his bombastic criticisms of Athens' neglect and decay under 12th century Byzantine rule. Mycoselos was a Byzantine Greek monk, philosopher, and teacher who advocated for a revival of Byzantine classical studies, the philosophies of Homer and Platon, his biographies on emperors like Basil II and Nikephoros III, and for his role as an important advisor to several emperors, starting with Constantine the Ninth and ending with Michael the Seventh, over a period of around 30 years. So pretty impressive statesman. Mikhtar Gosh was an Armenian writer, thinker, and scholar who was seen as a chief contributor to the Armenian Renaissance. He wrote a code of laws for civilian as well as religious life that was used by Armenians in Greater Armenia, Cilicia, and even Poland as late as 1772, which is pretty impressive. Nachmanides or Moses ben Nachman was a medieval Jewish scholar, Catalan rabbi, physician, and philosopher who, following the destruction of Jerusalem by the Crusaders in 1099, or I'm sorry, liberation, greatly assisted with reestablishing the Jewish community there. He also advocated for reconciliation of the Jewish communities in Spain over their support or lack thereof of Maimonides' Mishnah Torah, which we talked about a little earlier. Namdev was a Vaishnava saint who is best known for his devotional songs, which unlike normal religious poetry that was common at the time, he wrote something called bhajans, which were made to be sung and incorporated traditional Indian music. He was, as best I can tell, a kind of pious and wise bard, more or less, which is pretty cool. Nasreddin Hoja is not a real person, but he's this beloved figure of Muslim folklore featured in thousands of stories that stretch from the Balkans to China in which he appears as a sometimes wise, sometimes holy figure, but is more often than not kind of like a humorous fool. 
If you have time, I recommend reading a few of these stories. They're really funny. I put them on the thumbnail for a reason. Definitely look him up. I don't have time to talk about them right now, but he's definitely a, a really funny character. Nikephoros Blimides, not a whole lot about this guy. Nikephoros was an author from the 13th century who, so far as I can tell, wrote books on numerous subjects, but his most well-known ones were those advocating for the reunification of the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic Church, which was considered controversial at the time. Nicetas Choniades was the brother of St. Michael, who we talked about a little bit ago. Nicetas, following the Fourth Crusade, served in the court of Nican, Emperor Theodore I, and devoted his life to literature. His main work, Thesaurus Oxidae Fidea, was often cited by heretical writers of the region in the 12th century, basically those who advocated for the unification of the Eastern Orthodox and Catholic churches. They, they were considered heretical, basically. As far as I was able to tell, don't shoot me. I don't know everything. I don't know anything. Omar Khayyam was a Persian polymath best known for his work in mathematics and astronomy. In mathematics, he is known for his work on the classification and the solution of cubic equations, as well as affording the world a better understanding of a parallel axiom. I don't know what any of that is. He also calculated the duration of the solar year to the point his Jalali calendar is still used today in the Persian calendar. That's crazy. This character, I have no idea who Peter the Eunuch is. I don't even think this is a real person. I googled him and could not find anything about him, and I'm actually almost positive he's the same character as the next one, which is Peter the Strapopadarchus. He was also a eunuch and originally a servant of Emperor Nikephoros II Phocus. He proved himself to be a strong and capable warrior despite being a eunuch and served as a high-ranking Byzantine general. He was present in the siege and capture of Antioch under Emperor John I Semichus and was a senior commander against the Rus forces of the famous Prince Sviatoslav, or husband of St. Olga of Kiev. It was during this campaign he supposedly defeated a Rus war leader in single combat, which is awesome. After Emperor John's death, he led a campaign of Emperor Basil II's loyalist forces against a rogue general in Asia Minor where he died in battle. So just a cool Byzantine eunuch general. Kind of actually crazy that there, this existed, but yeah, that was him. Petarch is often called the founder of Renaissance humanism and even to a degree the modern Italian language. He was a scholar and a poet, but not just any poet. He was the second poet laurelate since classical antiquity, which he earned for his epic poem written in Latin titled Africa about the great Roman general Scipio Africanus. He also personally found a collection of letters written by Cicero, which was one of the catalysts for the Italian Renaissance, and is also sometimes credited with the creation of the supposed term medieval dark ages, which I'm sure many modern historians and scholars uh, love him for. All right, we're on 75, which means we have 25 to go. I got this, we're three fourths of the way through. I'm feeling good, I got a tea. I hope you have a tea. I hope you've had a snack. Robin Barsama is actually a really cool character because he was a Chinese monk who embarked on a pilgrimage from Yan, China to Jerusalem on behalf of the Church of the East. But he never actually made it to the Holy City because there was unrest caused by the Crusades there. Still, due to his popularity during his travels, he did make it as far as Rome and Paris before eventually settling in Baghdad where he died in 1294. His journey, which he wrote about towards the end of his life, is one of the most important historical accounts of the era painting a vivid picture of the end of the medieval crusades from the eyes of a person who not only got to see it and was outside of it from a political stance, but was a truly intelligent man. Ramanuja was a Indian guru, philosopher, and social reformer, and was one of the most important supporters of the Sri Vaishnavism tradition in Hinduism, and was a prominent member of the Bhakti movement, which, as we stated earlier, way earlier in the video, sought to bring religious reforms to all strata of society and actively rebelled against societal discrimination within the caste system. Rashi was a French rabbi who was well known for his ability to translate biblical texts and present a basic meaning in a way that appealed to not only theologians and scholars, but beginners and laymen alike. His commentaries of the Talmud, the central text of rabbinic Judaism after the Bible, has been included with every edition of the Talmud since its first printing in 1520. Regino of Prum, the Benedictine abbot whose most famous work, the Chronicon, details a universal history of Jesus Christ to the year 906 and is often used by scholars as an important source of late Carolingian history. Roger Bacon was a Franciscan friar and scientist who in his own lifetime was considered a sort of wizard, partially for his creation of something known as the Brazen Head, which was an automaton that was supposedly able to answer various questions and was seen as necromantic art. But beyond the supernatural, Roger is regarded as one of the earliest advocates of our present day scientific method suggested, which he took from the teachings of a Hazen. He used these methods to study nature and he even created his own version of gunpowder during his alchemical studies. His Opus Magis, made at the request of Pope Clement IV, is a 878-page treatise on topics ranging from natural science, 
grammar, logic, physics, and philosophy. Roger DeFleur might be one of my favorite people on this list because he was basically a real life landless adventurer. He was a member of the Knights Templar, became a pirate after being accused of theft by the Pope, fought for the King of Sicily as a vice admiral and was named the Count of Malta, led his army of mercenaries known as the Catalan Company against the Ottomans on behalf of the Byzantine Empire, where after he was adopted into the Imperial family and married the niece of Emperor Ivan Asin III of Bulgaria, was named Caesar, though mostly a ceremonial title by that time, and then was assassinated in Adrianople in 1305 by Emperor Michael IX. His Catalan company later avenged his death by plundering Macedonia and Thrace. What a Chad. Absolutely would love to play this character. That sounds crazy. Sadia Gaon was a Jewish scholar, philosopher, and interpreter of biblical text. Sadia is best known as the first important rabbinic figure to write in Judeo-Arabic. His work, The Book of Beliefs and Opinions, is the first detailed attempt to integrate Jewish theology with ancient Greek theology. Simonis is a, another eunuch and, like the others on this list, was an incredibly influential official for the Byzantine Empire. The Arab Simonis enters historical prominence when he was made into a eunuch after being captured by the Byzantines and entered into the service of the Zautzes family, which at the time was headed by a powerful minister and father-in-law of, of Emperor Leo VI, also known as the Wise. When Simonis revealed that the emperor's wife, Zoe, was attempting a coup against her husband, Simonis was entered into imperial service where he quickly rose to become Leo's right-hand man, whom he served in a sort of security and intelligence role. He thereafter continued to rise the ranks until 907 when he was given the rank of supreme eunuch, a post at that time vacant since 867. Pretty cool. Sargas Pitsock is probably one of the shortest people on this list, and by short I mean not like stature-wise, but what he did. He was an Armenian artist who illuminated and illustrated some 50 manuscripts for Armenian nobility and royalty. So he was a he was an artist. Sekohar was a Indian poet who wrote the Periya Puranam, an epic tale which is 4,253 verses long and details the lives of 63 Shaiva Nayanars or saints. It is the 12th and final book of the sacred Shaiva canon. Shota Rustavelli is considered by many to be the preeminent poet of the Georgian Golden Age. Rustavelli was perhaps the greatest contributor to Georgian literature with his work, The Knight in the Panther's Skin, which is a fictitious and colorful allegory to the rule of King Tamar of Georgia. It is considered a masterpiece and is today Georgia's national epic poem. Snorri Sturluson, I don't think I need to tell you who this is, but I'm going to anyway. He served as All Thing or Prime Minister of Iceland twice and authored or at least compiled the Prose Edda, a variation on the Poetic Edda, which today is the most complete and detailed source of Norse mythology in the modern world. He also authored the Heimskringla, a history of Norse kings beginning with the Yingling of family, and potentially also authored Egil's Saga, meaning we may owe him thanks for two of the other characters that we talked about on this list, which is pretty cool. Solomon Ibn Gabriel was an accomplished Jewish poet of medieval Al-Andalus, or uh, medieval Muslim Spain. Solomon published over a hundred poems as well as extensive biblical, philosophical, and ethical works. Some sources say he made a golem for his household chores, which is pretty funny. Today he is credited as an important source for philosophy students studying the medieval era as he wrote extensively on, on the soul and divine will. Theodore Matochites was a Byzantine Greek statesman and philosopher. Theodore served as a sort of senator or chancellor for over 20 years and was the close personal advisor to Emperor Andronicus II Palaiologos. And he was also one of the richest men of his time, which he used to support the arts, which is a big thing in Byzantine history. Theophanes the Greek confuses me because he's from modern day Turkey, but he was born in Byzantium but he's considered one of the greatest Russian icon painters of the medieval period. I don't know. Theophanes' style influenced the 15th century Novogorod school of painting as well as the successor school in Moscow, and he was also the teacher and mentor of the great Russian painter Andrei Rublev. Saint Theophylact was the archbishop of the Akrada region of Byzantine Bulgaria. There he defended Bulgarian autonomy and independence from the machinations of Constantinople, bitterly winning the respect and love of the people. This despite the fact that in his personal letters to his friends, he constantly complained about the Bulgarians and thought of them as barbarians and tried to get removed from his post, but he constantly failed at doing so. Though through these letters, scholars have learned much about the economic, social, and political history of that region. So we have him to thank for that. St. Thomas Aquinas is probably one of the most recognizable minds of the medieval period. He was a Dominican friar, philosopher, and theologian, was a proponent of natural theology, a type of theology that attempts to argue for theological topics based on reason and science. And through this, he created the philosophical and theological school known as Thomas 
Islamism. Writings like the Summa Theologica, Disputed Questions on Truth, and the Summa Contra Gentilis are considered some of the most influential works of medieval philosophy and theology. And today, many scholars regard him as the most influential thinker of the medieval period. Like St. Hildegard, he is considered a doctor of the faith for his contributions on behalf of what he believed to be truth and reason, although many of his findings are probably a little interesting if you want to read them. What are the odds we have two St. Thomases in a row? And this will be one of the rare cases I'm going to explain the whole story more or less because St. Thomas is not famous for anything other than dying, really. St. Thomas was the Archbishop of Canterbury and came to be a political enemy of King Henry II, who, in early 1164, presided over a meeting of English clergy and asked them to more or less agree to less independence and power and a weaker connection to Rome. Surprisingly, all but one of them, Becket, agreed to sign the document agreeing to this, and he was summoned again later in that year to answer for his contempt to royal authority, of which he was found guilty, but enraged, he stormed out and fled to France, where he lived in an abbey in Pontigny. But when Henry threatened the order back home, the order that, that that abbey belonged to, Becket pleaded with the Pope for drastic measures, including Henry II's excommunication. But the Pope was basically like, wait a minute, that's pretty drastic. Why don't you just go back if I talk to the king? And the king and the Pope made an agreement, and Becket returned in 1170. In June of that year, when the bishops of York, Bohon, and Salisbury crowned the heir apparent Henry the Younger, Becket was infuriated, as this honor was historically reserved for the Bishop of Canterbury, and he excommunicated the three of them. Under this pretense, and this gross breach of power, Henry II ordered Becket to be assassinated, which is kind of extreme, and on December 29th, 1170, four knights barged into the Canterbury Cathedral and brutally slew him. Pope Alexander III canonized Becket little more than two years later. King Henry II offered penance at his tomb, and St. Thomas Becket's assassins were excommunicated, but given the chance to serve as knights in the Holy Land to be forgiven. And with that, the Knights of St. Thomas, inspired by the sentence and modeled after the Teutonic Order, were founded. Thorbjörg the Seeress was featured in the saga of Eric the Red. She seems like she was just a Seeress, which is a woman who was said to have the ability to see the future and perform sorcery. I couldn't really find out much about her. She has some stories that are in the saga, but you don't really need to know that. She just can see the future and do magic, which is cool. Vajapati was a polymath, poet, playwright, philosopher, royal priest, and basically did everything. Though we in the West are probably not very familiar with him, I know I'm not, but he's said to be equal to Dante or Chaucer, if you wanted a contemporary like parallel. I will not attempt to explain his works at length. As I've said previously, I do not have the proper context of Indian history or literature to do them justice, but he seems to be an enormously important writer from medieval India who is more than worthy of admiration and probably to play as. Widukind was a medieval Saxon chronicler who many believe may have been related to the famous Widukind who battled against Charlemagne, his writings on the Ottonian dynasty are considered important historical records from that era, which makes sense. William of Ockham. I know you nerds have heard of Ockham's razor. I'm sure you've used it in your Reddit comments or something. I don't know. The simplest answer is often the best starting point to find the truth or is often the answer itself, which William didn't actually make. It was actually just named after him because he used the principle so much in his own life and findings. Given the fact they named this problem solving principle after him, it probably comes as no surprise that William was a hugely intelligent man whom many consider to be one of the most important thinkers of the medieval era, like literally every other scholar on this list. Can you tell I'm over the scholars? Can you tell? Thank God this next guy is not a scholar. I would have gone insane. William Wallace, the famed Scottish knight and freedom lover. Sir William Wallace was one of the primary leaders of the first Scottish War of Independence. He is credited with the Scottish victory at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297, where after he was appointed the Guardian of Scotland, which he served in until the following year after his loss at the Battle of Falkirk. Some say he spent the next few years in the courts of France and maybe even Rome attempting to gather aid, although he didn't receive any, and then he returned to Scotland sometime around 1304 when he, and participated in a few skirmishes before being captured in 1305, where he was taken to London, put on a trial which many modern scholars consider to be one of the first trials against what we would call war crimes, and executed pretty horribly. He was hung until near dead, where after he was emasculated, he was, he was made into a eunuch, if you want to be polite, had his... Uh, intestines cut out and then he was beheaded and quartered and his limbs were then displayed publicly in various English castles and locations. Uh, he's remembered as a Scottish national hero and his companion Robert the Bruce ended up winning the war and also was king of Scotland. So it has a happy ending but not really for William. Yehuda, I'm sorry. I know, I know you're a poet. I know you're a poet. One of the greatest Hebrew poets of all time in fact. He spent most of his life in Al-Andalus of Spain where he worked as a physician and great thinker. Yusuf Ibn Al-Khal was an 11th century Egyptian Jewish prince merchant who seemed to primarily work in import export and everything from precious metals, spices, and rare textiles. Basically, he was a, he was a merchant mogul. 
Essentially, he's a famous merchant in his own life who's well documented by letters he wrote or were written to him by his family and associates. So that's it's everything you need to know about him. Javisha Czerny, I don't know if I said your name right, also known as Javisha the Black, was a Polish knight and nobleman who briefly served as a member of the Teutonic Order before defecting to the Polish where he fought at the Battle of Grunwald for the King of Lithuania and Poland, Władysław II Jogailo. He thereafter proposed a treaty between Jogailo and then King of Hungary Sigismund of Luxembourg. He won numerous tournaments throughout his life and was a supporter of Jan Hus, although he actually fought against the Hussites on behalf of King Sigismund, and died in 1428 defending the retreat of Sigismund despite being sent for and demanded to leave with him. His supposed last words to his men were, there is no boat big enough to lift my honor. He was known in life and remembered after as the epitome of knightly virtue. And there we come to the end of this video. It feels like an eternity. Maybe it's because we've talked about so many things, but I'm happy to have shared this time with you. I hope you use this time to do something productive, learn something new, learn about these characters, and now you can go out and you can just play as them and you can have a great time. And I hope this video was useful for more than listening to me butcher the names of 101 historical characters. But that is going to be it for me. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I'm Soul. If you like this video, please give it a like, comment, and subscribe because I cannot tell you how long it took me to write this and to make it and to find all this information. It was actually a lot longer than you would think, but thank you. Bye-bye.